Okay, we're gonna get started. Good afternoon, my name is Pam Hunter, assembly member from New York, right over the bridge, but from Syracuse. It's good to see all of you here this afternoon for the Health Insurance and Long-Term Care Issues Committee. Um, we have you after lunch, so unfortunately you may be a little sleepy. Um, that's probably a little better than being the last session of the day and the last day. Thank you, Will, we appreciate that. Um, our first discussion actually today is going to be about medical coverage for obesity, so a great conversation right after lunch. <laughs> so we need to have a motion to waive quorum, please. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. We also need a motion to accept the minutes of our last March 6th meeting. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. We are going to move forward to the presentation of legislative toolkit on developments in medical coverage for obesity. Um, it's good to see Randy again. He's the founder of Randolph Pate Advisors. And we are going to have a discussion. This discussion probably lasts a little bit over 15 minutes and want to make sure we allow for questions. So Randy, please. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman um, and members of the committee. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I hope everybody had a healthy lunch. Uh, I tried to have a healthy lunch. Um, but I, I want to advance the slides here, I think. Is that? Oh, you're OK. <clears throat> I have a slide deck, but um, as some of you may recall, last year I had the opportunity to testify on the same issue. Um, before this committee, so I'm really excited to be back. But uh, based on some of the conversations that I had um, with, with some of you and, and others, I've put together a toolkit of options uh, for state policymakers who really want to dig into some of the barriers for obesity coverage in particular uh, in their states. The toolkit I've put together, uh, Will, I believe, is going to post it uh, following this meeting. We'll make sure he has it. It's about 30 pages long. It focuses on a number of practical solutions uh, that I think you know, can really help to address some of these barriers in financing and coverage. Um, I think there's some innovative proposals in here that I want to talk about, but uh, I think they are achievable, and I think the recommendations will really uh, balance both, you know, affordability and access to care. So this slide uh, shows that today over 42% of Americans have obesity and that's defined as having a BMI of 30 or higher. Uh, and experts predict that by the end of this decade, fully half of Americans will have a BMI of 30 or higher, uh, which is really uh, shocking. And as you can see from this slide, uh, obesity prevalence is higher in the South and the Midwest, in the South where I come from, but it is a nationwide problem. Back in 2000, which doesn't seem like that long ago, no state in the union had an obesity prevalence of over 25%. Right now, all but three states uh, now have, uh, have crossed that threshold. 2020 CDC data show that there, right now there are 16 states with an obesity, obesity prevalence of 35% or higher, which was an increase of four states in just one year. The available data are also clear that racial and ethnic disparities play a role in the nation's obesity crisis. African Americans have a 51% higher obesity prevalence, and Hispanics have a 21% higher obesity prevalence than whites. This slide illustrates the path that we're currently on. Using current trends, it projects that what the most common BMI will be in each state by the year 2030. You can see the projection for African Americans on the far left, where in the majority of states, the most common BMI for African Americans will be 35 or higher, which is considered severe or morbid obesity. Looking at all these groups, none of them are on a good pathway when it comes to obesity, but using the current trends, the predictions are particularly dire for African American and Hispanic American populations. This slide shows the most common BMI prevalence in each state, again projected to 2030, but this time by income group. For nearly all of the states, severe obesity will be the most common BMI for Americans making less than $20,000 a year by the end of this decade. The map does get slightly better as you go up the income scale, but clearly we can see that obesity is a disease associated with socioeconomic status. 
and for all of us in this country, obes the costs of obesity are high and growing. While we spend roughly $480 billion a year on direct medical costs of obesity, including over $60 billion uh, through Medicare and Medicaid uh, alone, the costs to individuals and to the economy are even greater. A recent study found that healthcare costs for people with obesity are around $3,500 a year higher than those with normal weight. And when the indirect costs are included, such as negative labor market outcomes like absenteeism and lower earning potential, the total economic costs of obesity are truly staggering, estimated at nearly $1.4 trillion per year, or roughly $4,300 for every man, woman, and child in the U.S. In the past, we viewed obesity primarily as resulting from flawed character or lack of willpower. This view has really perpetuated a lot of the stigma and shame for people uh, both inside and outside of the healthcare system. And unfortunately, today it continues to deter millions of people from seeking medical help that they need. Instead of seeking advice and care rooted in sound medicine, Americans with obesity have often, often resorted to unsustainable fad diets, dangerous supplements, and other potentially harmful approaches based on risky or false assumptions. But to effectively address the obesity crisis in this country, we have to change our attitudes, especially when it comes to health care, our, our health care system, and public policy. Uh, there was a recent Wall Street Journal editorial by University of Chicago economist and former member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Tomas Philipson, in which he posits two major economic shifts as the primary root causes of the obesity crisis. First, technological advancement, which has caused Americans' work to become more sedentary, and second, increased agricultural output that greatly reduced the cost of food. Supporting his thesis is the fact that obesity uh, as an epidemic is not merely an American problem anymore, but one observed in many other developed countries where these same shifts have occurred. In his piece, Philipson propose, proposes that public programs like Medicare and Medicaid, as well as private insurers, should increase coverage of new anti-obesity medications, or AOMs, as a means to reverse obesity and lower overall health care costs. Thankfully, a number of key developments have really helped to reshape attitudes towards obesity and seeking medical treatment. For example, in 2013, the American Medical Association officially recognized obesity as a chronic disease. And while there's still a lot to be done uh, to continue to shift attitudes in the healthcare system, this change represents a marked shift in the view toward obesity, away from purely a matter of personal choice or character towards a treatable disease that the healthcare system and those of us who oversee it should work to address. Like other chronic diseases, obesity treatment requires a continuum of care, including primary care, anti-obesity medications or AOMs, and surgical interventions. In particular, some of the new and more effective AOMs coming on the market promise to bridge the gap in obesity treatment options between behavioral interventions and more invasive options like bariatric surgery. While these new interventions can be highly effective, numerous barriers remain in the way of patients receiving them. Insurance coverage for obesity treatment, which is the focus of my toolkit, is often limited. This has resulted in a patchwork of coverage for the continuum of obesity care treatments across the states. For example, while every state's essential health benefits benchmark plan, which governs ACA compliant plans in the individual and small group health insurance markets, covers basic obesity screening and counseling to some degree, only 38 states benchmark plans include coverage for nutritional counseling, and only 23 uh, states cover bariatric surgery, and only two currently cover AOMs. But increasingly, policymakers at both the state and federal levels, federal levels are looking at these barriers and taking action to address them. Just to cite a couple of recent examples, the state of New Mexico amended its essential health benefits benchmark plan uh, to extend coverage for AOMs and anti-obesity programs uh, with those changes going to effect for plan year 2020. And earlier this year, the Federal Office of Personnel Management required insurers participating in the Federal Employee Benefits Program to provide ad adequate coverage of FDA-approved AOMs on formulary. State policymakers wishing to address insurance barriers to effective obesity treatment do have the ability to do so. 
the, the toolkit sets forth some options, including a number of innovative approaches that state policymakers can use to expand coverage for obesity treatment in a cost-effective and fiscally responsible way. But rather than simply listing out options, the toolkit discusses best practices among states when available, and it makes specific recommendations for implementing each option. It also offers guidance on practical considerations, including timelines and who can act within each state. And it also includes a, a glossary of terms on the first page to make it easier for state policymakers to use the toolkit. And because every state is different, each recommendation is adaptable for the state's needs, including discussion of potential variations and sub-options. And perhaps most importantly, this toolkit does not shy away from taking on cost and utilization concerns, recognizing that in order for any state anti-obesity program to be successful, it must be both affordable and sustainable. It does not recommend simply legislatively mandating new coverage for obesity treatment. Rather, it is cognizant of the trade-offs inherent in expanding benefits or uncovering new drugs and therapies and discusses the payer perspective on these issues as well. For each option, the toolkit provides a simple explanation of the background and the problem, focusing in on options that are feasible, achievable, and realistic. Several of the options included in this toolkit are bold and innovative, but each recognizes trade-offs and the need for states to manage costs. In the interest of time and to leave time for questions, I just want to briefly highlight a couple of the options that, uh, in the toolkit. First of all, states can broaden coverage for obesity, as I mentioned, through uh, 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 state employee benefit plans. States do have great latitude in this area in how they choose to finance and operate their public employee health plans. For example, both states self-fund their employee plans uh, and contract with third-party administrators to process their claims. This basically means that states can largely decide what services they want to cover and uh, to which employees they want to offer coverage. Using this flexibility, state policymakers have the opportunity to pursue innovative strategies for controlling costs while maintaining or increasing health plan quality. Not only that, but because state governments are often the largest employers in the state, uh, these state employee plans provide an excellent opportunity to test the effectiveness of innovative policy reforms. Oops. And, and next, as I mentioned, states can also amend their essential health benefits benchmark plans to broaden coverage. Um, uh, New Mexico took that option a couple of years ago. Um, but if you, if you go back, most states initially chose their benchmark plans based on the most popular small group plan available in 2013. And while they have, many of them have updated their benchmarks over the years, again, most of these benchmark plans were selected before obesity was designated as a chronic condition or before the availability of some of these new, more effective AOMs on the market. Therefore, many of the benchmark plans entirely exclude or greatly limit coverage for obesity treatments. Starting in 2020, the federal government provided new options for states to make adjustments to their existing EHB benchmark plans. Uh, so far, as I mentioned, two states have changed their benchmark plans specifically to cover uh, obesity treatment, and those are New Mexico and North Carolina. In order to uh, receive approval under federal regulations for this change, the state's benchmark plan amendment must meet a generosity test, meaning that the cost of any new benefit uh, to be included in the benchmark plan cannot have a material impact on premium rates. This means that any premium impact must be less than a 1% imp uh, increase. In submitting its successful application, New Mexico relied on an independent actuarial study finding that expanding weight loss drug coverage to patients with obesity rather than those with uh, just morbid or severe obesity alone would not materially impact premiums. And finally, states can leverage ACA Section 1332 waivers to reduce pricing uncertainty and incentivize private insurers to cover obesity treatments. States may apply for these state innovation waivers, otherwise known as Section 1332 waivers, to modify many of the ACA central coverage provisions. These provisions may be waived as part of a state's plan under the waiver to implement innovative programs that best fit the state's unique health care needs. If a Section 1332 waiver results in a reduction of federal spending on premium tax credits, small business, health insurance tax credits, or cost sharing reductions, states can receive the difference in pass-through funding to support the state's waiver plan. In 2022, the federal government awarded states over $1.87 billion in pass-through payments to carry out their Section 1332 waivers. Since 2017, the federal government has approved 18 Section 1332 waivers. 16 of these are for state reinsurance programs, 
aimed at improving affordability of coverage. In addition to placing downward pressure on insurance premiums, reinsurance programs can make insurers and plan actuaries more comfortable about incorporating new therapies into coverage by reducing some of the risk involved. Analysis of CMS data has shown that not only do reinsurance programs result in lower premiums, but they're also associated with increased insurer competition in those markets. The more competition in the market, the more likely insurers will be willing to adopt new therapies or broaden coverage in order to attract enrollees. States wishing to go further to provide coverage for obesity treatments can explore even more innovative approaches through Section 1332 waivers. For instance, states could directly combine a reinsurance waiver with increased coverage for comprehensive obesity care or specific treatments such as AOMs. Under such a hybrid reinsurance EHB waiver approach, the state would first waive the definition of EHB to require insurers to incorporate obesity coverage into the benchmark. Now, on its own, waiving the benchmark to broaden coverage of health care service, uh, services or add new benefits would potentially violate the law's deficit neutrality guardrail because it would likely lead to some level of increased premiums and federal outlays. But the next step would be to combine the EHB waiver with a state reinsurance program that lowers premiums across the board in the market. This reduces federal outlays, resulting in pass-through funding for the state to carry out its waiver. In the third step, the state could then use a small portion of the pass-through funds to offset any higher costs of covering obesity treatments such as AOMs. This hybrid approach and others like it offer a low-risk, high-reward pathway for states to expand coverage for obesity treatment while lowering overall premiums in the individual market. Today, state policymakers around the country, you're all grappling with runaway health care costs and the resulting pressure on state budgets. But in doing so, we should all not lose sight of the end goal to help our citizens lead healthier, more productive lives. The cost of inaction on obesity grows every day and can no longer be ignored. In fact, there's mounting evidence that the greater, that greater coverage for effective obesity treatments can actually help to lower health care costs and increase economic efficiency over time. If undertaken carefully and appropriately, these options and others not only promise to help state residents lead healthier, more productive lives, but can also save money in the long run. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I have to tell you, I'm feeling a little guilty eating the pasta at lunch, but I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, and then we're going to go to Representative Metzger's. Did the toolkit include any considerations of factors like emergency health issues like COVID? Um, you know, people have the, the COVID weight. I think that there's a lot of times that we're not taking into consider, consideration other factors that contribute other than uh, poverty uh, relative to, to weight gain, but also wanted to know if there's anything in the toolkit uh, relative to inflation where um, people have less disposable, and I don't like mm -hmm. that word, income, where they may not make as good healthy food choices with less resources. Thank you. Thanks for the question, and absolutely, I, I do talk about those issues uh, in the toolkit. The you know the COVID uh, epidemic, you know, as a lot of people know, people with COVID were more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to die uh, from the disease as a result of uh, being obese. Um, and certainly, coming out of the epidemic and of the pandemic, uh, you know, I think you know all of us have experienced you know the the weight gain or the the COVID weight, as as, as you talked about, um, you know. I, I see it as part of an overall trend, though, in the in the data. When you look back, you know, 20 years ago, we still are on the same trend of, you know, half of the country being uh, obese by, uh, you know, the end of this decade. And so I think, you know, the toolkit is really uh, looking at, you know, you know, a number of different options. You know, I, I think there are, you know, through Section 1332 waivers, for example, to get to your other question, you know, I think there are probably opportunities to look at things like uh, social determinants of health and other sorts of broader um, um, efforts to try to get at, you know, some of these issues with food security and things like that as well. Thank you. Uh, Representative Metzgers, then we'll go to Representative, uh, Rep uh, excuse me, Senator Felskowski. I guess, you know, obesity as a addiction and a social policy issue, it's, it's one we need to address and deal with. I can see that, you know, in a constituent base, in service to the community. But when I'm listening to your, your conversation or, your, or your, um, your presentation, we're net talking about incremental or supplemental costs to resolve the issue. 
So, I mean, I think we have to be frank about that, right? So it's a social and a addiction issue that, we, that we're thinking of dealing with. The subsidies and, and workarounds are because, at least in the current em environment, the insurance companies don't see ultimately the treatment versus the cost of obesity as being equally measurable. And that could be externalities that insurance companies don't bear. Um, and that surprises me given the cost of ins insulin, given the cost of hospitalization, given knee replacements, hip replacements, everything uh, associated with aging and obesity. So um, I'm surprised at the numbers. Can, is there any kind of measurement of the, without taking externalities, is there a measurement of the cost differential between a person who makes its, the demands and claims on the insurance industry and, and medical costs versus the obesity and the treatment? Do you have a rough estimate of what that cost looks like? Well, the, uh, actually, there is a, a study that came out looking at Medicare and uh, Medicaid coverage of uh, you know the full range of obesity treatments, and found that you know for those programs over you know I think it was a ten-year window that it would actually save those programs money to you know when you talk about not having as high rates of heart disease you know, diabetes, you know, these other attendant conditions. So you're, it, you know, I look at it sort of like, you know, drugs for hypertension, for example. I mean, hypertension on its own, it's bad, but, it, you know, they call it a silent killer because it doesn't, you know, it shows up in other, other health problems like stroke and, and heart disease. I, th I think it's the same thing with obesity. Uh, and I agree that, you know, there is, there is an issue, and I talk about it in the toolkit of, you know, anytime an insurance company is looking at covering a new therapy, you're trying to, the actuaries are trying to see what the utilization is going to be, predict what it's going to be, um, and it's really difficult, you know, when you don't have that solid data, you know, although we're starting to get it, we don't have, you know, necessarily the solid data, uh, you know, uh, an experience on that. But I think, like, the, the 1332 waiver idea I, I'm, I'm proposing is designed to, and some of the other ideas are designed to sort of uh, provide a little cushion for the pricing actuaries for the, the insurance companies to cover it and then see what the experience is over time and hopefully you know the, the value proposition will be there I think it will be uh, and you know as that uh, Wall Street Journal editorial was talking about as well I think the value proposition will be there uh, but this, these are ways to sort of you know test it out and get it uh, into coverage. Thank you. Randy, we need to make sure that we uh, stay on track here so we are going to go to um, uh, Senator next, and then Representative Nuccio, and then Representative Paul, if you could make sure your questions are concise, please. We need to move forward. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I guess one of my largest concerns as a policymaker, if we say that, okay, now take a pill, and, you know, we're going to help you with your obesity, and you're saying that within the 10 years that, you know, we can actually show that we're going to reduce costs because we're going to save it on the, you know, on the heart disease and everything else. But at what point, then, do people stop trying to curb it on their own, and we're just exasperating it, and 90% of the United States has taken a pill for obesity instead of, you know, getting at the root cause. Cheap food, processed food, lack of exercise, and education. I mean, it's like a slippery slope, and that concerns me as a legislator. Right, and, and my suggestion is not uh, to just, you know, I, first of all, there's no magic pill to, to solve the problem, right? And my suggestion is not that that just be covered and that be the end of the discussion at all. Uh, the way the continuum of care really is supposed to work is, you know, you start with diet and exercise, you start with nutrition counseling, you start with these less invasive uh, interventions. Now, I, I do believe the healthcare system needs to do a better job of, you know, when you go to the doctor, screening you and explaining your options and getting you plugged into these things, I think we could do a much better job of that. Mm -hmm. um, but really, the, the, the AOMs, the medications, are really just designed to be there when those things have failed. And, you know, I think I talk about in the toolkit about, you know, ways to sort of, you know, make sure that, that that's the way the, the prescription works and that's the way the utilization management works. Um, but no, I, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. All of these other factors have to be addressed as well. This is just part of, you know, how the healthcare system can hopefully step up uh, on this on this epidemic. Just a one follow up on that, and I understand. I mean, there is some people where it's a genetic issue, and no matter what they do. But I think for the majority of people, and you can see it in the trending, obesity, you know, go back 50 years was not the issue that it is today. So it's very much lifestyle, calories in, calories out, exercise. 
Um, but my, when you use the term supposed to work, that's a huge red flag for me. Because we as a society have gotten very lazy. We go to the doctor and we want a pill to take care of everything without putting in the work to do it. And the pressure will be for that pill not doing the work. And I mean, I don't think we're lazy. I think, you know, when I think about the, the economic factors, right, it used to be that most people in this country, part of your job involves some sort of strenuous physical activity for, you know, eight hours minimum a day, probably five, six days a week. Uh, and we just don't live like that anymore. I don't think that, you know, I, I don't think that we're, you know, our, in, now we're more, we have less character or less willpower that we've had in the past. I think we've got different problems and complex problems that technology can hope to address. I mean, technology is part of the reason we got into this mess. And hopefully, you know, it should be part of the answer to get us out of it. But yeah, I, I don't think, you know, overall, I think, you know, all of these things should be part of the, the discussion. They should all be options. You know, the toolkits focus is really on how can we better engage the healthcare system and bring some of these technologies to bear on the problem. Okay, thank you. Tammy? Trying to figure out how to work the technology. Um, so my question is what kind of statement question. We've looked at legislation similar to this in our state. We're a small state. 3.6 million people, and in order to, uh, if we had mandated something like this, first of all, it's only going to affect, which we all know in this room, 15% of the populace, 220,000 people in the state of Connecticut, and it, the cost is well over $4 million a year to do something like this. Um, so that's a problem for me, especially when I hear doctors who say, like, the bariatric surgery, it's a 60% success rate, and 50% of those people will gain the weight back. Um, so it's like a cycle. And the problem that I have with, uh, with the drugs, I'm not sure whether or not there's enough research there to show, again, whether it's going to have long-term sustaining, sustaining effects. But I had a question here, and it went out my head. Um, <laughs> trying to remember now. Um, but I'm also under the impression that the majority of insurance companies pay for bariatric surgery. It's part. Well, actually, it's part of a benefit. It's a part of a part of a benefit structure that is included in it. So, is this just the AOM drugs, and what is the cost of those drugs? Right. So, it depends on the market you're looking at. So, you know, this toolkit is. You know, I talk about the employee. I mean, the um, essential health benefits benchmark. Right. That applies to the individual health insurance market and the small group market, and then you've got the large group. You know. Uh, self-insured and fully insured markets. So it's it's kind of a patchwork when it comes to the, and I, I can get the data on that. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea is that when I say it's a patchwork, that means some states may cover bariatric surgery, but they may not cover the nutrition counseling. Some states maybe cover the nutrition counseling, but they don't cover the AOMs. So the point I'm trying to make is when you look at it, you know, all the, you know, I'm not a clinician and, and, you know, I don't have all the data, but when the, from what I've read, you really have to have the continuum there. You have to have all of those options there available to people to really get the long-term, you know, results. So you don't have people gaining the weight back and, it, and it's sustainable over time, uh, which is really what I'm arguing in this toolkit. Representative Paul. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've enjoyed discussions as an obese person. It's, it's good to hear about how, how this works. And I'm interested in going back to your data of, of how you were calculated, you know, how we got to this point now. Why, why are we here? And I think a lot of it was, like you said, the work. Maybe, you know, nowadays there's, there's two working families, you know, or both the man and the woman and family are working, so there's less better prepared meals. But, you know, the, the slide where you're showing the income levels it was dramatically worse for the income and also for their different races. What, what is the majority factor in that? Is the, is, the, is the fact that these races might be lower income and that's where they're higher? Or is it a race has a higher reason over the income? Which one is the controlling there? Or do you have any idea? Well, I, I've read literature. I haven't done my own studies on this. I will say exactly to your point, it's very, very complicated, this problem. It seems to be related to, you know, lack of education, lack of income, 
uh, lower access to recreational facilities or all sorts of factors that go into it. Um, but again, it's very complex. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there are a lot of us who have plenty of access to all those things and we still, you know, we still struggle. So, um, you know, I would say it's a very complex problem. I don't think we're fully there in terms of, you know, how do we fix it? How do we, you know, really understand it? Um, but I, I do think some of these, you know, these things, these ideas I'm talking about ought to be first steps that we should look at in order to try to get our, get a handle on this. Thank you. Uh, so we need to move on. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Randy is going to be submitting the toolkit um, to NCOIL that will be disseminated to its members, and then you can move forward and bring those back to your state. So, Randy, thank you very much for your attendance here today. We're going to move on to the presentation on using health insurance rate review authority uh, to constrain care costs. We have the Honorable Chris Kohler here today, who is a former Rhode Island Health Commissioner. Um, interesting conversations relative to your state in capping individual premium rates uh, and consolidation of hospitals. So, sir, if you could, and we do need to keep the program moving along. Thank you. I got the message. Thank you very much, Representative and members of the committee. Um, I'm going to speak from the experience of both the Millbank Memorial Fund, um, I'll explain what that is in a moment, and then my own experience as health insurance commissioner in Rhode Island from 2005 to 2013. I got f four tenants to make. I think health insurance is fundamentally different from other kinds of insurance, so we ought to have policy that reflects that. Um, we've got a real problem with commercial health insurance affordability. Um, you can use health insurance rate review as a tool to get at that, not to solve it. Um, and that's in, that's in points three and four. So this is what the fund is about. Um, we are an independent operating foundation. We're just across the river here um, in Manhattan. Um, we work on health policy leadership. We work on specific state issues like state health policy issues like um, uh, affordability and primary care. And then we publish communications. Um, our mission is, as it says there, is to improve population health and health equity by collaborating with folks like yourselves and connecting you with um, evidence, sound evidence and experience. So my first tenet, health insurance is fundamentally different. We don't mandate insurance coverage for oil changes, but we mandate insurance coverage for preventive services. We don't require body shops to treat anyone who comes in, but we require it of emergency room doctors. And we don't treat roofers in a special way to make sure that they get paid adequately. All those are things that we do for health care in our public policy. It says that we look at health insurance in a fundamentally different way. And I think that was the genesis uh, that inspired Rhode Island legislators in the early aughts to actually break out health insurance regulation from the rest of insurance regulation, give it a different set of start charges, and that leads to how you look at rate review. So, and I think we're gathered here. You always say, define, what's the problem we're trying to solve? We got an issue with affordability. It has permeated these conversations we talked about in terms of what we see. We talked about the spring with 340B. You've all seen um, data such as this. I like this one because it indexes everything to general price inflation. And you can see that employees are bearing the costs of that. So as health care costs go up, employers are bearing a bigger and bigger uh, portion of it. The causes are systemic and they're getting worse. This is my version of um, the obesity map. This is just showing how we've got an affordability issue that's getting worse over time. This is data from the Commonwealth Fund. If you can't read the, um, the detail, it is um, the average employee share of premium plus deductible. So it's, it's all the cost sharing as a percentage of median income. Dark is worse, and we're getting more and more dark. So this is an, an increasing problem. Um, I'm here to say that you got two, the problem is mostly in commercial health insurance as opposed to Medicaid and Medicare. And analysis would say that the two major drivers of this are health systems and pharmaceuticals. This is a lot of data from um, uh, by state. Each of these vertical lines is a state. Um, the red triangle is the average hospital payments, inpatient and outpatient, indexed to Medicare. So the average overall commercial payment is 235% roughly of what Medicare pays, and there's enormous variation by state. So, the, so you see that um, the, this is a array from those that are closest to Medicare, 
versus those that are at the highest at the far end. There are a lot of reasons for this kind of variation. The main story, though, is that with Medicaid and Medicare constraining prices, health systems are consolidating and extracting prices from commercial health insurance. And employers and employees are paying the cost. Actually, employers pay the cost for it. They pass it to employees, and they pass it to customers in terms of what we pay for our prices. Um, the other culprit is pharmacy. I know we have representatives here from pharmacy, I mean, excuse me, from um, Connecticut. This is data from Connecticut that looks at different cost drivers. The um, horizontal access is cost per member per year, and the vertical access is the trend over time. The orange dot is pharmacy, and the blue is hospital outpatient. So you can see that um, that is where our money is going when we talk about affordability issues. Um, Don Berwick. Um, who has been uh, served in a number of different positions in federal and um, thought leadership positions, refers to health care as being confiscatory. This is data that he got from Massachusetts that shows that as a state budget, you can see that all the things that we want to spend money on or skimp in on, this is pre-COVID, um, uh, pre-ARPA and stuff like that. So this is older data because the money's going into health care. It's worth noting that all those things on the right, human services, public health, mental health, education, are all things that actually improve health over time, but we've been busy pumping it into the health care system. So we can think about, in general, when we think about affordability, historically there have been three strategies around affordability. We play whack-a-mole and we go after specific areas. We toss the hot potato to somebody else, whether it's an employee, an employer, we get someone else to pick up the cost. Medicaid's very good at that, get someone else to do it. Or we have magical thinking and we put forth evidence-based policies, non-evidence-based policies and hope that it makes a difference. I'm, I'm, our position is that systemic problems require systemic solutions. You've got to start with good data to get a common view of reality. You've got to get alignment of policies across payers, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. And there's still room for competition, but it's within, with, someone playing the, with some referee playing the rules. Commercial health insurance rate review can be part of that. It can get the commercial health insurance into the game to start getting at the systemic affordability issues. And that's why we talk about rate review as a tool to improve affordability. The system needs a sheriff, particularly on the commercial side, because what you got is kind of the wild, wild west out there, and you need some folks. When I did it, I just said, look, I didn't have a cowboy hat. I had a black and white striped shirt, and I was calling, just trying to make sure everybody was playing by the rules, and we're moving in a direction towards affordability. I'm going to put forth some language um, and, and items to consider as you think about rate review and the, the job of health insurance. I want to make the case that the traditional charge of how insur insurance regulators work that with the standards you've given them doesn't work for health care. They traditionally have these first two. Their job is to guard the solvency of insurers and to protect the public interest and the interests of consumers by making sure contracts are honored. Um, I think for health care you need some other things. We care about the treatment of providers and we care about the system as a whole and we want to direct health plans and the players in the systems towards affordability. Those are statutory standards that Insure, regulators can't assume they have to be given to them by you as the legislators. And when you do that, then you can have expectations of what happens in your rate review process. Then when you think about rate review, you have to understand the scope of it. Um, Mr. Wu from, um, uh, and uh, our colleagues from the feds can talk about what's required under federal law to, what's, uh, to demonstrate that you have adequate rate review for the individual market, but think about do you, your, your other markets, your small group, your large group, think about what the type of rate review, is it file and use, is it, um, does it vary by market authority? Think about the scope. Um, in Rhode Island, we work with individual, small group, and large. That gives us a consistent way of directing, with the, insurer, directing the insurers and working with the providers. And think about consumer protection authority. And do you have specific requirements for affordability? Um, I won't get into the detail. This is from our colleagues at the National Academy of State Health Policy. This is sample language of what you can put in to increase those standards and to have broader standards for health insurance than what you have for um, uh, other lines of insurance. Um, 
Well, so what's been the experience of states as they've done this rate review, whether it's in Rhode Island, um, where we had rate, we have rate review for individual small group and large group. Colorado does not have it for large group. Colorado uses rate review to balance transparency and proprietary information. So they're the referee, and they're just there. I think what they're doing is promoting more transparency than previously existed so that folks can understand what actually is driving the cost increases. It's not just a number, say, well, this is our plan, we think it costs this much, but let's understand price and utilization trend by hospital, by provider, so that you can understand, get that kind of data that we had earlier to understand what's really driving premiums, that it's not just about any one victim and it's not one simple solution. Um, Comprehensive rate review is part of an affordability strategy. Here are some specific things that you can either require in statute or direct your regulators towards, and then they consider this notion of prior approval. Do the rates have to be approved um, before they can be implemented? A public analysis of submissions, trends, and driver analysis. In my experience, this is really important. Folks have to understand what's driving health care costs and get away from simple solutions like, well, let's just eliminate uh, uh, I had, when I came in, someone said, let's eliminate the CEO's salary from Blue Cross, and that'll make health care affordable. No, it won't. And we need to understand that it is provider rates, it's pharmacy utilization. Um, and then if you're particularly ambitious, you can develop affordability standards, you or your regulators, that you want the entire system working towards. What are the things that will get at the underlying drivers of affordability? These are things that have been tried in different states. Delaware and Rhode Island is in the middle, and, and actually Oregon, I should add that to it as well, are actually telling the insurers to spend more on primary care as a portion of their total budget, to transfer money from other places to put more on primary care. In Rhode Island and Delaware, we've actually limited the rate of growth at which hospital prices can grow. It's been in place in Rhode Island for 10 years. You can use the legislation to advance provider payment reforms to get providers off of fee-for-service. You can use the uh, uh, rate review to encourage participation in your state-based exchange. And there's been a lot of topic about public option products now on the, on the exchange. We work at the Millbank Memorial Fund particularly closely with the eight states that are listed at the bottom around understanding underlying cost drivers and getting a common view of reality so you can focus policy on the areas that will get at systemic costs. I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, so what have been some of the results? This is the history in Delaware. They actually started out with a separate office of health-based uh, health care affordability, health care delivery. They developed affordability standards. Then the legislature actually gave DOI the um, ability to enforce those standards, put in place the, the, the broader charge for health insurance, the so way exists for other lines of insurance, and enforcement is due to begin. In Colorado, um, this points to the savings that they have versus what was submitted versus what it was decided in their small and large group rates, um, amounting to oh, half a billion over the nine years and affecting three million Coloradans. And then in Rhode Island, um, this is trend in overall all-in per capita costs compared to a control group that's the same population, same age and sex demographics, you can see that in 2011, when we implemented hospital rate caps, our trend flattened. Those are that, and we went below our control group. That is real dollars that's delivered to employers and to employees. We can document less cost sharing that's going on to employees and delivery system improvements. Let's be careful, health insurance rate review isn't going to save everything. We get resistance from health insurers in some places when we try to put this in. There's concern about consistent enforcement, as well as larger providers who have, frankly, had a pretty good time working in uh, the system the way it is now. And it's not going to solve for monopoly providers. It's not going to, it raises the risk of regulatory capture. It doesn't solve for self-insured employers who are over half of the market, although they sometimes benefit. In Rhode Island, the self-insured folks have benefited from these rate caps and everything else that your voters don't like about health care because you get complaints all the time about stuff and rate review is only a partial solution. So where I'll close is this really is an important policy issue. I'm happy and, and, and very privileged to be able to speak with you folks about it. We fundamentally have to decide is health care a tool for economic growth, in which case we have to live with increasing disparities and affordability issues, or is it something that everyone is entitled to and that 
um, we want to have reasonable access to so that we can use money for employees that they can take home and spend with their families. We can spend on social services because that's not what we've got right now with our health care economy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to Senator for our question. Anyone else? Thank you. So one of the things you said is alignment of policies between Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. Can you expand on what you mean by that? Sure. Um, if you, Pat, let's say you and your legislators, you um, say to your regulators, look, get the insurers in line, get them doing the same thing. What that gives the regulator the authority to do is to get the employ the excuse me the insurers in the same room and adopt consistent policies that treat providers in the same way. If you talk to providers, they will say what really drives them crazy is differential policies from different insurers. We get different things from different Medicaid managed care organizations, different prior authorization requirements, different administrative requirements, different goals around payment reform, different formulary drug lists. The, the provider says, saying, stop the madness. Okay. Get some force to get them together. And this gives your regulator the authority to get folks in a room and say, okay, let's all get on the same page. In Rhode Island, there are 12 quality measures that the, all insurers have to report on. Nothing more. The providers love it because they get a line set of measures that they're held accountable for. One way of paying for primary care. That's the kind of alignment that we're talking about. And if you're getting a blueprint for Medicare, we're not super smart. Let's just align with Medicare and try to, try to further get some synergies. It's this cost of confusion that we're trying to get rid of. Thank you. We're going to go to Representative Lewis, uh, Lewis and then Representative Oliverson to close with the questions. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very informative. Uh, on the presentation, you had listed a uh, provider growth uh, cap. What is that and how does that work? Sure. Um, as a result of the data that we were collecting in rate review, we could document that insurers were expecting an 8 to 9 percent price increase in their hospital contracts. And I could use that to go to employers and say, okay, 40 percent of your insurance premium is going to go up by 8 or 9 percent. That leaves that's 3% on your base right there before any money goes to any place else. What are we going to do about that? And so that, that created, frankly, the political will for me to turn to the insurers and say, you know what, from here on out, the, only give the providers CPI, Medic, uh, Consumer Price Index plus one. If it's good enough for Medicare, it's good enough for you. And so the insurers implemented that. And that's what resulted in that flattening of the curve. Um, so this, is, this was our attempt to address some of the price discussions that we're, now we're finding throughout the country around these hospital prices. And Delaware is following suit, and some other people are talking about it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris, I appreciate your presentation very much. Uh, but I'm curious, so you, you mentioned in here under your obstacles, I think it was your last slide, you were talking about limitations. Uh, self-insured employers, obviously you're re referencing ERISA, I assume. Uh, so I, I know in my state we're, we're down to less than 20 percent of our marketplace is actually fully insured. So have you observed any, what's, what's the net effect of this type of regulation in terms of shifting the balance for or against self-employed uh, plans? Because I, I think that would be one of my concerns is just that I'm, I'm going to force more employers out and well, into the self-insured market. So uh, the, the, I'll only speak for Rhode Island because that's the place I'm most familiar with. I would argue that the steps that we've taken in Rhode Island have, they, first of all, they benefited self-insured because the insurers are the administrators and, the, and, and they impose the, those same price caps on their self-insured contracts as on their fully insured contracts. So the self-insured are getting a free ride, basically. And, um, uh, but Rhode Island has the same issue of erosion of that fully insured market. Okay. I don't think these regulations have led to it. I think, it's, frankly, it's favorable selection. But it any, hasn't reversed the trend. No, it hasn't reversed okay. the trend. So, I mean, because you've got, so long as, if you've got an insurance pool, half of those people are going to be below costs, and those half people are, those, those employers are going to get cherry picked. They're going to be, get approached by a broker who's going to say, you know, I can get you a better deal if you self-insure. And, and that's, a, that's a bigger issue than, frankly, what 
you can solve your insurance commissioner. But it's, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chris's presentation is on the app and also the website as well. If you wanted to dive into it a little more. Uh, yeah, and feel, and feel free to contact me or, or, and the Millbank Fund. We're happy. We work with folks like you all the time, and, and including a number of folks in this room. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move on to our discussions on the prep, uh, preparations and implications of the end of the public health emergency. Many and all, I guess probably most of our states, um, are going to be having a wave of increased people needing to recertify their health insurance, and many people are going to be dropping off and may not be eligible for insurance. So if you could, uh, please, Miranda. So thank you very much. Um, and I will say I ap appreciated the, the shout out this morning and I'm, I'm hoping that our um, discussion and uh, conversation this afternoon sort of lives up to uh, that comment. But again, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to uh, speak and have a conversation about um, what uh, the chairwoman said is, is really sitting in front of um, every single state in terms of the work that needs to be done once the public health emergency ends. Um, and so I did want to just take a couple of quick moments uh, to run through, just really as a reminder um, for everybody to sort of remember all of the, um, what I'm going to call emergencies, um, waivers, um, flexibilities that were put in place uh, once the COVID pandemic hit. Because I do think that it's really, really important to remember the series of things that happened. Um, and then obviously with a very close attention and focus on the public health emergency and then how that will impact um, Medicaid. Um, and so as I said, a deeper dive specifically on the redeterminations that um, will need to take place all across the country. Um, again, here are two or three slides really to walk through all of the authorities uh, that are, were at play or are at play um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. So the first, obviously, the public health emergency, which is the one we will come back to, uh, which provide, provided certain things and triggered certain um, issues. Um, the National Emergencies Act, uh, which de was declared in March of 2020, um, there was a renewal date um, with, and then um, uh, an additional renewal um, for March 1st with no specific end date. And again, it activated specific things under the federal statute, uh, particularly allowing temporary waivers or modifications of uh, certain requirements in Medicare, Medicaid, and the CHIP program. Uh, the Stafford Act, uh, which was declared in March 13th, 2020, again, which enabled FEMA to help deliver um, um, vaccines response or the virus response funds to state and local governments. Um, the PrEP Act, which you, I'm sure, have, have um, very much heard about, was invoked in March as well, um, provided 10 additional amendments. Uh, that will end October the 1st of 2024, and it essentially authorizes HHS to limit certain legal liabilities. Um, and then emergency youth authorizations, which were um, incredibly important as it related to vaccines declared on March 27th, uh, 2022. Um, and allowed the FDA to authorize when certain conditions were met, uh, the emergency use of um, certain medical uh, products or unapproved uses of, appro of approved medical uh, products uh, to diagnose, treat, and prevent uh, serious life-threatening um, diseases or conditions. Um, the other thing that it's really important to remember is um, there were also a couple of major federal um, legislative actions um, that tied into the public health emergency. So the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, um, referred to as CARES, and the American Rescue Plan Act. There were also a series of changes that waived or modified at the administrative level um, you know, well, again, a wide range of requirements that sit within Medicaid, Medicare, uh, CHIP, and HIPAA. Um, those um, administrative changes provided some additional flexibility, um, particularly in the con uh, commercial insurance markets. And then I also think it's really important to remember that in each one of your states, 
Um, there were a variety of mechanisms that the, the governors or the legislatures put forward to make sure that there were certain authorities available uh, during COVID. Um, so as it relates to the state emergency declarations, I do think it's really, really important as you think about your own state situation to really go back to those original authorities and understand what um, triggered them, what was the basis of them to really help you understand once we um, unwind some of these things. So, you know, some of the state emergency declarations uh, referenced the federal PHE. Some of them referenced a specific state PHE. Some of them referenced both actions by the state and the um, federal government. Um, some of them were just general um, um, COVID-19 public health challenges, right? So there's a general uh, public health crisis, and so this is what we're going to point to. And then some, some of those were silent. So, you know, as I said here, a complete review of those individual state actions will just be really important to understand what will happen, when it will happen, and what it will sort of look like on the ground in your states. Um, just going back to some of those changes that I referenced by the federal legislation, I wanted to just quickly um, mention um, with most emphasis on the fourth bullet, but, you know, key federal legislative uh, provisions were tied to that federal PHE, so coverage for COVID testing and testing-related services without cost-sharing in the commercial market and for Medicare. Um, coverage without cost sharing um, for nearly all Medicaid populations for the COVID vaccine and the administration costs that were associated with that. Um, coverage for testing and treatment, um, uh, again, for Medicaid populations. And then this last um, bullet, again, is where we're going to focus on. So an increase um, of 6.2 percentage points in the state's FMAP. Um, provided that states maintained what you'll hear referred to as a maintenance of effort requirement. So in other words, if, making sure that everybody who is on Medicaid stays on Medicaid and does not get bumped off of Medicaid during the public health emergency crisis. So as long as those things um, were met, um, and they, those things have to be met um, through the end of the month in which the public health emergency ends. So that's the, the, the trigger in terms of time and the additional federal resources that were available, but they were contingent upon um, um, states making sure that individuals that had access to Medicaid coverage continued to have access to that coverage. Uh, I would also wanted to run through a couple of important dates, both for now and then certainly as we think about it in the future. Uh, the end date of the public health emergency was most recently extended to July 15th, which is actually uh, tomorrow. Um, once the PHE ends, um, most of the flexibilities and requirements will end automatically. Um, relative to that increase um, of that 6.2 percentage points that I talked about, if the PHE is not once again extended, I just wanted to provide some dates to give you some context in terms of what the triggers will start to look like. So the continuous enrollment requirement will end on August the 1st. The enhanced FMAP will conclude at the end of the quarter, um, so September the 30th of 2022. Um, I will reiterate, and many of you are probably aware of this, the administration has indicated that they would give states a 60-day notice to help plan and prepare for that before the end of the, um, P before the PHE actually expires. Um, and, you know, the states were not notified on May 16th. Uh, so I say here we are assuming that the PHE will be uh, extended uh, at least um, once again. Um, and then, so in terms of dates, future dates that you should also be attuned to, if it is extended for a get another 90 days, that 90-day period will end on October 13th, and that 60-day notice out to states would be given um, on August the 14th. So again, just a couple of dates to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, Medicaid redeterminations, just a quick overview, what it is, um, why it has to be done. So pre- P, the public health emergency, states were required to annually verify that the individuals that were um, um, given or had Medicaid coverage were eligible for that coverage. What has changed? I talked about what had changed as a condition of receiving additional funds. 
The states had to maintain those individuals um, and make sure that they continued to receive coverage through Medicaid. Um, post PHE, when it ends, the states will resume the processes. So why is that significant? Obviously, you know, in sitting here as a legislator or as a regulator, why is it important? Um, first of all, the volume um, in terms of the number of individuals that will need to be uh, redetermined is significant, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. The second thing is, is that states will have 12 months to initiate and then 14 months to complete. So 12 months to initiate and then an additional two on top of that to complete. Uh, the full renewal of individuals that are currently enrolled in Medicaid, CHIP, and the basic health plan. So now we have a time frame by which it has to be done. And then states, counties, and beneficiaries have not had to do this or have not done this in two years. And so as you think about staffings within Medicaid agencies, as you think about staffings at the county level, if the counties are the ones that are actually performing the Medicaid redeterminations, and then similarly, those individuals that are receiving coverage through Medicaid, they have not had to go through this verifying purpose, um, um, process in order to maintain their coverage in two years. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the numbers. So how many individuals are we talking about in terms of that volume, that comment about the volume is significant? Um, slightly more than one in four Americans rely on Medicaid um, for their coverage and care today. So making it an uh, essential safety net for 87 million individuals. We, I think, firsthand now understand how important health care coverage is coming out of a, a, a pandemic and understanding how important it is to have access uh, to health care, um, you know, which is made possible through health insurance. Um, you'll see here that I've cited some numbers from um, the Kaiser Family Foundation. Again, these should be live links. So the total Medicaid chip enrollment um, has grown um, approximately 87.4 million. So that's an increase of 16.1 million from uh, enrollment from February 2022. That increase may be attributed to a couple of different things, right? Economic conditions policy changes. So one of those may be um, postpartum coverage. Um, in many states I know right now, um, either legislatures or through um, waiver plans, states are allowing 12 months of postpartum coverage. Um, or as I talked about, this temporary continuous enrollment requirement. So all of those things are um, contributing to this increase. Um, between 5.3 million and 4.2 million Medicaid enrollees could be disenrolled in the months following the end of the um, pandemic, the end of the PHE. I know that that is a big delta, but you'll see there, again, those numbers are from an analysis that Kaiser Family Foundation uh, put forward, and they actually did a survey of state officials. You'll see one there from January 2022 and then February um, 2022, and it's those two numbers that provide the range of which we think um, individuals um, potentially could lose coverage. Again, the other thing that may be interesting for you to look at is there is a 50-state um, survey that provides a lot of good information if you want to look detailed at your own individual state in terms of what those numbers look like. The ver process at very high level, very general, there are federal and state requirements as it relates to what needs to be done for Medicaid redeterminations. Um, those processes do vary um, depending upon eligibility, so, you know, income, um, if it, it, whether it's a waiver population, whether an individual has disability status. Um, and me your Medicaid agency may um, be using information or they can use information through other sources to decide whether or not somebody may be eligible um, for Medicaid or CHIP. If more information is needed, the state will reach out to that individual and ask for that individual for that additional information so that they can verify that that individual is still eligible for Medicaid. Again, I put a link here uh, to very basic um, enrollment um, information, and there is also a link here, I believe, to um, what each different state requires for that too. If you're interested, okay. Um, 
the stakes are high. I talked about how the volume is significant. I talked about um, how this hasn't been done in two years um, and um, the number of individuals that are at risk. The stakes are high because, you know, you'll have individual patients um, that might be deemed ineligible uh, because their verification was unsuccessful. So in other words, you might have an individual who is now not eligible for Medicaid coverage just because they weren't able to verify their eligibility. They may still be eligible for Medicaid coverage. Um, you're going to have in ineligible patients um, who will become uninsured and may not be able to find another uh, source of health care. Um, the other thing that it will be very important to remember and understand is, you know, you're going to have, there will be providers on the ground in the states who will have been treating individuals who had a reimbursement source for their health care coverage and now may not. Um, the other thing is, obviously, those individuals that lose their health care coverage, um, it will increase states' uninsured rates. And then we talked a little bit earlier about how affordability to, you know, and uninsured rates are obviously and ultimately going to impact um, other kinds of um, health insurance coverage because of the cost shifting that happens and takes place. I just wanted to spend a, just a couple of my last minutes on... Um, 10 fundamental actions that states can take as they are preparing to unwind. Um, there are 10 different actions, as I said. There's a link here. Um, this is information um, that uh, CMS has made available to states. There are a number of different state um, toolkits that are out there that I'm sure uh, Mr. Wu, Wu will talk about. But I wanted to walk through some of these. Um, so first is creating a comprehensive state winding operational plan. That seems to be a no-brainer, but really states to sit down and understand how they're going to accomplish that, how they're going to make sure that there's continuity of coverage, um, and fi actually facilitate the transitions of coverage uh, that individuals are going to need uh, to have. Second is to coordinate with the partners, and um, including the state and the tribal and the government partners. So working with states uh, sister agencies, um, leveraging uh, gov other government agencies, um, coordinating with um, your exchange marketplace, whether that's a federally facilitated marketplace or a state-based marketplace, um, um, consulting with tribes to help support what that strategic planning uh, looks like is really is all going to be very important. Um, implementing and strengthening automated processes. So, you know, this includes ex parte re renewals. You might hear this term, which is essentially um, doing as much of this as possible without having to, to touch the person, whether it's online, um, whether it's via phone, so that that process is as automated as possible for the beneficiary. Uh, work early and closely with uh, system um, vendors, eligibility system vendors, to identify the changes and the starts, the planning, and um, really performing that robust te in, um, test testing that needs to be done end-to-end. -end. Um, establishing a renewal distribution program, so really, again, understand um, how a state's going to account for and mitigate churn. Um, really account for any workforce challenges or system challenges that they may have due to capacity. Um, engaging with community partners, health plans, and providers in the community is going to be very, very important. And many of your states are doing this um, in a um, terrific way, um, working with the community partners, working with hospitals, working with providers, um, working with health plans. So, you know, making sure that they're working with the Medicaid managed care plans, making sure that they're working with the health plans that might be um, providing um, products or coverage through the exchange marketplace, so the QHPs, um, and really leveraging those um, constituencies to serve as, you know, workforce arms of the states to help them do this. Uh, obtaining updated contact information, which will probably be the most challenging uh, um, issue. Um, so really implementing and utilizing multiple strategies to make sure that there's uh, mitigation of coverage losses and, and, you know, using those strategies to make sure that you can um, have the most recent contact information and are trying to contact that eligible uh, beneficiary in, in multiple different ways. Launching an effective communication strategy. You've probably seen this in many of your states already where there is uh, multiple strategies, uh, messaging, communications on the ground to make sure that there is first and foremost an awareness that this is coming and then what needs to be done. 
Um, assess eligibility, enrollment, and fair hearing um, work capacity. Again, this is just making sure, again, going back and, um, you know, that there are sufficient um, workforces in place to in ensuring that there's adequate staffing and sufficient training to uh, complete this work. And then developing a robust monitoring strategy um, so that there is a, an approach and a framework in place to make sure that the reporting that will need to be done uh, to CMS is ready to go. Uh, so with that, I am happy to answer any questions, and I would say I, I am really hopeful that this is maybe the start of a couple of conversations as this gets closer um, to sort of understand um, how this is going and certainly the work that is being done on the ground. But uh, again, so appreciate the opportunity to spend a couple minutes talking about this. Thank you. It's almost inconceivable, at least in my state, that they would be prepared to re-enroll millions of people within that short time frame. Even engaging community partners and our counties are responsible for enrollments. So this is very um, urgent that we're having this conversation. But my quick question, and then we're going to go to Representative Oliverson and then Representative Anderson, followed by Senator Hackett, is, is there money from the federal government to states to help implement or to cover gaps um, that are going to be put in place? Uh, so I think, and I'm going to look to Mr. Wu if he corrects me, I think the answer to, in terms of direct dollars, the answer to that is no. I mean, the, that additional FMAP money will go away. Um, but there may be other dollars that states can use in terms of infrastructure preparedness and those sorts of things that they can use to get ready and help systems and those sorts of things. And I do believe some states are actually utilizing some of those dollars. Representative Oliverson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Miranda, great, great talk. And I was just curious as you were laying all this out, and I mean, you kind of gave a lot of reasons why you know this is going to create a lot of issues for a lot of people and I guess the thing that just kept popping in my head was um, you know given the administration and the current you know thought process and the folks that are kind of in power and stuff like that I mean what's the rush right you got all these people that are on continuous eligibility right now for going on two years including states that have stubbornly refused to expand Medicaid like my home state and now you got people that can't roll off the rolls. So, I mean, have you heard anything? Has there been any discussion? And maybe, Mr. Wu, you have some thoughts on this. Is anyone talking about whether the administration just kind of keeps kicking the can down the road because maybe it's politically good to do that? Well, I, I, think, I think the rush is caused by the fact that the, <coughs> the way the statute is structured, mm -hmm. right? The, this FMAP goes away in this continuous... Um, uh, maintenance of effort uh, requirement goes away. And then, in fact, the normal Medicaid standards, which require um, redeterminations, kick in, at which point we'll have this, this big issue. Now, normally this is a, an incremental you know, thing that happens every month. But, in fact, now we're going to have a situation where, uh, because the law has, has called for states not to do this, we will have a two-year backlog, a giant tidal wave of of, of folks to handle, and that's going to be a big challenge. You're saying that, that statutorily at the federal level that there's nothing that can be done from an agency standpoint that this is, this is going to happen, that Correct. the health emergency is going to, so that, because I guess I was listening to your presentation, Miranda, and I got the impression there was still part of this where it's just kind of in the cycle of, well, we're just going to keep renewing it and renewing oh, it. And the, not, the renewal of the public yeah, health emergency. And sure. I guess that's my question is, I mean, not that, not that I'm necessarily you know, like, yay, I'm in favor of that as a, as a Texan, but I'm just like, I'm just thinking based on kind of where things are at the national level, it's like, what's the hurry? Yeah, I, I, so I, I can't speak with a lot of detail to this, but, um, uh, but I do think like a lot of factors go into, you know, this determination of whether or not to extend the, the PHE. This is obviously one of them. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is a big deal, but there's... You know, as, as, as Miranda noted, there's, there's a zillion flexibilities out there that, 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 that are in place. And, and um, you know, I, I, I do think the PHE is not intended to go on uh, to go on forever. And at some point, we'll have to turn off. And at which point, all this, uh, will, uh, this whole cascade of work uh, is going to have to happen. And that's why, um, you know, agencies in all of your states and the federal government have, have you know, and, and so many private sector entities have been 
furiously working together to try to get ready, um, knowing that there's a deadline coming at an uncertain point. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I realize we have about seven more minutes in this meeting. Uh, but y'all y'all ask my questions already, so I'll yield to someone else. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Senator Hackett followed in closing with Representative Ferguson. And they, they asked my question, the close to answer, answer my question is, you know, uh, a lot of this is because of competition. We pay much better wages. You know, people are making more money, et cetera. But one thing I don't, I don't see you talking about is, you know, Medicaid is, is really good health coverage, and people are going to get forced off to higher deductible plans and coverage. Why don't we talk about the cliff effect that actually, you know, we're going to have a number of people have, take home less money even though they're making more money. So is, it, is the protection already in there that we don't have the cliff effect problem or what? So as I, as I talked, that's a great question. So as I talked about the transitions to other coverage, right? So if we're talking about somebody who is deemed ineligible, um, you know, the, the goal would be that they would go to one or two markets, right? One would be the marketplaces um, where it will be really important for the ARPA subsidies to get extended as well because those subsidies have really helped the exchange marketplace become more affordable. Um, but to your point, the other option for some of those may be access to employer coverage. If they've gotten a job, if their economic situation has changed, it may be that they have access to that employer coverage. And, you know, to your question about what to be done in terms of, you know, high deductibles or the high cost sharing, you know, I do think that that goes back to a lot of the conversation that we've been having today. You know, the those... Um, um, issues are a direct reflection of the affordability of the underlying cost of care, right? You know, I, I always say cost sharing and deductibles plus premiums equals, right, your health insurance costs. And so those things, um, or, you know, it, it's the underlying cost of health care. And so un until we sort of get at that, um, but individuals who are going to lose that hopefully we'll have options under those two marketplaces. Yeah, but, you know, you're saying, and I know it's only one question, but, you, you know, Medicaid is great coverage. Medicaid doesn't cost them anything. Now they get worse coverage that they have to pay out of their pocket, even though they're making more money and not eligible for Medicaid. So, so the net result to the worker, the income went up $1,000, $2,000 a year, is less take-home dollars. How are they going to get through that? So, so I would, I would, I would reiterate. You know, certainly with the ARPA subsidies and that help for so many, it made that coverage much more affordable. And for many of them, um, there is, um, you know, it is, it is very minimal, right? If, if not zero. Um, so, you know, that has helped for many individuals that have to move over to that exchange marketplace. Um, but it's a challenge. Is, is there ARPA monies? Last question. Is the ARPA monies, are there cases where the subsidy pays the entire thing? I thought it would always, at the best, yes. pay part of it. Does it pay 100%? Correct. Okay. I did not know that. And we can, we've got some information about that in terms of how it's impacted in different states, and I'm happy to share that with you as well. Thank you. Deborah, to close, and then we're going to go to you, Mr. Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the thing I haven't heard you discuss, and I don't, maybe Arkansas is an, an outlier, but talk about the ramifications for patients, but for states, Arkansas is a small state, and we're making about $75 million a quarter because of the 6.2% enhanced reimbursement. Is that typical of other states? I mean, it's going to be a huge financial loss for us to lose the enhanced reimbursement. You know, I don't know the, the specific answer in terms of where the different states are um, it, relative to that number. Um, I'm sure we can, can get that for you in terms of, you know, where different states um, fall as it relates to that increased FMAP amount. The, the one thing I, I would just like to leave with, again, it, hopefully we can have this as a continued conversation, but the other thing I would encourage as legislators, if you are getting, 
you know, calls once this starts, if you get start to get questions. You know, I do think there's a real opportunity um, to work with your Medicaid agencies or your sister agencies to make sure that either you or your staff have some, you know, really good talking points or some answers as, as you're going to be getting some of these calls, because I really do think that that will help arm and really help understand, you know, the constituencies that you're going to hear from understand what's happening. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Wu, we're going to give you more than one minute. Um, <laughs> so we're going to run right up to our next um, committee. So if you would, please, on your health care marketplace priorities, please. Uh, absolutely. And, and thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Chairwoman Hunter, and, uh, and to all the members for the chance to, to be here. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, it's uh, uh, a particular pleasure because I get to share the panel here with uh, my former boss and good friend, uh, Randy Pate, um, who, uh, as, as a former Sasayo director, there have been a number of Sasayo leaders uh, who have come uh, to, to this session before, and I'm very happy to be here for that. Um, just in the interest of time, I will hit on a, on a couple of highlights, really focusing on uh, the big priorities we have this year, uh, and we'll speak uh, a couple of sentences each on uh, the No Surprises Act. Uh, I'll touch a little bit further on um, uh, the Medicaid unwinding process, which really is a major, major priority uh, of ours. I'll talk a little bit about uh, Section 1332 waivers, and then I'll talk just a few sentences about um, our regulatory priorities uh, going forward as well. And in each of these areas, I think there are opportunities for coordination uh, and cooperation between between the federal levels and the state levels uh, as a matter of, uh, of statutory work, of, as a matter of administrative agencies working together on, on many of these problems. So let me start with the No Surprises Act. Um, uh, it's been a very busy year. A year and a half ago, Congress, uh, in a bipartisan manner, passed the No Surprises Act, and we have been uh, implementing furiously uh, this very complex statute ever since. Um, at the beginning of this year, the consumer protections of that law uh, went into place, uh, and some number of months after that, we, we, we put in place the arbitration process. But there are many, many other uh, transparency uh, and consumer protection uh, aspects of this law that are that are to come, and we're going to be very busy working on those. Of course, this is is not a new issue. Uh, many of your states have laws in place and have had laws in place for a number of years, uh, providing consumers protections against surprise billing. Those those laws have worked very well, uh, and and we have looked uh, very closely at many of those laws and and their operations in in helping us understand how to implement uh, our law. But, um, but now that there's a federal structure in place, the landscape becomes much more complicated because uh, states that have their own provisions, uh, those provisions apply, and then otherwise the federal uh, provisions apply. And in many states, it's sort of a patchwork. It kind of depends on which providers and, and which t types of plans and, and which circumstances. And so um, there's a, an extensive process of of cooperation and coordination happening right now between uh, regulatory agencies uh, and authorities in your states and um, and CMS in, in defining those lines and, and making sure that handoffs and, and enforcement uh, occurs and that consumers uh, get the protections of this law. So lots more to come uh, in, in this area. It is a, a really remarkable change to the way commercial uh, health insurance works in this country and it's going to have uh, big effects and, and the most positive effects of course the protections of the consumers that have already uh, kicked in to the extent that any of you are interested in uh, working on uh, 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 measures or legislation in this area, uh, tweaking state laws, uh, make, making these these regimes uh, al align better together. Uh, I will say right here, we are very very happy to to, to work with you. We're happy to provide uh, uh, our our thoughts, our advice on on uh, on on the way these regimes uh, uh, can work together better. Um, and and there will be many years of work on. Uh, on, on, on this structure to make sure that it works uh, well for consumers. Um, secondly, a, a couple of sentences on, on the unwinding effort. Um, Mir Miranda very ably uh, talked through the, uh, the, 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 the real issue that, that, that is happening. I, I can assure you that um, uh, at CMS and, and across the entire federal government, we're taking a, a whole of government approach to this issue. We think it is uh, extremely important. Uh, it, is, it is nearly inevitable that some people will fall through the cracks as we look at the millions of people that will be going through a mandatory uh, uh, re-enrollment process. And so we're working very hard with 
uh, our partner exchanges in the states, as well as all of the state me Medicaid agencies, uh, we're working on things like making sure that the, the quality of the data transfer between uh, those entities um, is consistent uh, and clear. Uh, that's sort of the foundation of, the, of this issue. We, wa we want uh, the exchanges, we want the Medicaid agencies to sort of know uh, which, which people are being redetermined, what is happening to those people, and we're building out a process to track um, all of those folks so, so that we can continue to, uh, to, to, to conduct outreach on those folks and have as few of those people fall through the cracks as, uh, as, as, as possible. But it is, um, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, uh, and uh, in, in some sense, for, uh, for my market exchanges that, that we run, it's an opportunity to really make sure that all those folks uh, uh, are, are picked up and, and continue to have high quality coverage. Um, as Miranda was noting, uh, if uh, the ARPA subsidies are extended, in fact, um, uh, the cliff effect that we were talking about a little bit earlier really is mitigated. Then folks can, uh, to the extent that they have not, you know, had had employer coverage that is, you know, that results in incomes that are that are much higher. If, if, if we're talking about something sort of within the range, then it can be a very smooth transition to high quality, uh, very affordable coverage. Um, let me say a couple of sentences about uh, state innovation waivers. We continue to be very uh, uh, busy. Uh, as, as we have been for many years now, working with states on Section 1332 waivers. So these are opportunities for states to craft their own programs, waive certain provisions of the uh, Affordable Care Act, and, um, and receive uh, pass-through funding to the extent it saves the federal government any, any money on, uh, on, on premium tax credit subsidies. Um, the process here is, you know, can, can be complicated, and, and, and my friend Randy knows this process very, very well, and, and it, it involves a lot of, uh, a lot of discussions with, with states, uh, especially when implementing uh, ambitious, uh, uh, thoughtful uh, waivers. Uh, now, many of our waivers are fairly cookie cutter. We have now 16 and counting reinsurance programs across states that are, that, that are, are fairly straightforward to, to implement at this point and have had um, uh, very positive impacts on, uh, on premiums and, and, and affordability for, uh, for consumers. But uh, I will also note that um, we're very interested in partnering with states to put in place uh, 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 other sorts of waivers. I'll note that uh, we have recently uh, approved a waiver in Colorado uh, that, to implement uh, uh, what they call the Colorado option. It has the effect of lowering premiums and health care costs uh, within, within that state, putting in place a, uh, a standard set of benefits uh, available to, to all consumers across, uh, uh, across the state, and it mandates uh, the lowering of health care premiums over, uh, over a course of, uh, of, of three years. And so we'll be working very closely with, with, with that state in the implementation of this waiver. Any of these Section 1332 uh, uh, innovation waivers requires uh, uh, legislative work. Uh, they, re they require passage of a law to um, uh, to point the state, uh, start the state down 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 this process. And and often we can be helpful in in in, in helping make sure that that all the required triggers in in that law are there, uh, giving giving the state maximum flexibility to do what what they want. Um, Last couple of sentences on our uh, regulatory agenda going forward. Every year, uh, CISIO puts out a payment notice, which is, which is the main rule that governs payment parameters across, uh, uh, across the individual market in particular, but, but the commercial market uh, uh, generally. Uh, last year's rule put in place um, uh, or reinstituted uh, standardized plan options on healthcare.gov, uh, as well as, as, as uh, reinstituting uh, network adequacy provisions. We're going to be looking, those are, are very significant provisions. We're going to be continuing to look very hard at the implementation of those provisions and any tweaking that is, uh, that is required there. Um, I'll also note that um, uh, our um, uh, 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 regulatory agenda, as, as listed uh, on the uh, OMB website has um, has pointed out the fact that uh, we uh, plan to regulate on short-term limited duration plans um, and uh, mental health parity in, uh, uh, in 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 the coming months. So so you can expect that as well. Finally, I'll say just a sentence about um, uh, individual coverage health reimbursement arrangements (ICRAs), which continues to be a uh, a new form of coverage available to really to, to small businesses and and any businesses that allows them to to have their employees. Uh, select uh, the coverage that's right for them in the individual market and, and have funds flow to those, um, those, those accounts. We're very interested in continuing to, to promote and monitor this market, and we have uh, put in place a number of data collection mechanisms to allow us to sort of track this more closely, but we continue to be very interested in this and, um, and are also interested in partnering with, um, 
uh, with states and private institutions on this front as well. Um, so with that, uh, happy to, to stop and take questions. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have any questions? Yes, yeah, Senator. And I will make it very quick. I just want to say in our state, uh, I serve on the Bob Bethel Committee, which is a committee that looks at these issues. And our um, Medicaid program, they have already been all along looking to see who didn't qualify. This is not going to be a two-year all of a sudden we're doing it. They know who they are. They already have the list. They've been keeping track of this all yep. along anyway. And I don't know if other states have been doing that, but I think that's a really good idea. We've stret we have a 12-month period to where they're going to look at the ones who probably have the highest income to take them off first and take yep. them off in a regimented way. So I appreciate the discussion on that. Just want to say as far as ICRAs go, Unfortunately, there are so many regulations on that and with the subsidization of the NARPA funds that have gone to right. the marketplace, you have very few people who would qualify for those. And then the last thing I'll say is the in the, in the marketplace, because we too have not expanded Medicaid, we find it easier for people. So those who have are at 12.5 at the poverty level up to 138%, basically get a free private health insurance plan with 250 total out of pocket, free doctor's visits, yep. $4 per, uh, generics are free as well, $5 for specialist visits. So they already have really low cost yep, plans coverage. that yep. they can buy. Yep. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here today and uh, giving your testimony. I don't believe that there's any other business in front of this committee, so can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Move we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.